It's such an amazing pleasure to stand here next to Setu. Um, we've been planning this visit for over a year. Mm -hmm. And when we originally spoke, um, we just, that we, the future was so uncertain that right. we, we were like, will it be online? Will it be, how will we do this? So I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. It's awesome. Um, all right. Hello, everyone. I am Jill Miller. Um, and I'm a visual artist and also an assistant professor in art practice. I'm also an executive member of the Berkeley Center for New Media, which we call BCNM. Um, and so BCNM is an interdisciplinary research center that studies and shapes media transition and emerging uh, diverse perspectives. So through critical thinking and making, we cultivate uh, technological fairness and equity in our classrooms, in our communities, and on the internet. So um, you are here in the Art, Technology, and Cultural Colloquium. Um, this was founded in 1997 by Ken Goldberg. Um, this is an internationally respected forum for creative ideas. Uh, it's free, open to the public, and we always present uh, leading artists, writers, critical thinkers, and people who question assumptions and push boundaries at the forefront of multiple intersecting fields. Uh, but before I, I introduce Setu, I wanna just take a minute to do a land acknowledgement. Um, so uh, give me a moment to honor the land that we're on. Uh, we recognize that BCNM is located in the territory of the Huchin, the ancestral and unceded lands of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, uh, specifically the confederated villages of Lijan. The history of prolific technological development in this region has always depended on this land and all of our technological infrastructures <clears throat> and activities take place on and in relation to this land. We com we're committed to supporting the sovereignty and the ongoing stewardship of the space by the Ohlone people through building long-term reciprocity and relationships with tribal leaders and organizations. Um, and I will now move into the introduction of our esteemed speaker. Um, so we are so pleased, as I said before, to host Stay to Jones. Um, we have generous co-sponsorship from American Cultures and the Department of Art Practice. Uh, Stay to Ken Jones is a multidisciplinary artist uh, advocate and maker based in St. Paul, Minnesota. Working between the arts and public spheres, Jones channels the spirit of radical social movements into experiences that foster creative, critical conversations and nurture a more just and vibrant community from the soil up. Setu is recognized as a dynamic collaborator and a creative force for civic engagement. He has created over 40 public artworks, co-founded a 13-acre public part, park in St. Paul with five acres dedicated to an organic farm, and created a socially engaged community dinner that served 2,000 people at a half-mile-long dinner table. He has brought together, I'm sorry, he's brought the project to other cities across the U.S., uh, in addition to originating it in his uh, town of St. Paul. Setu truly brings people together, as we saw so beautifully in the workshop that he held yesterday at Platform Art Space on the Berkeley campus, and we are delighted to have him visit. So welcome, Setu. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. I appreciate that. And you know, as Jill was describing this, we had really did start talking about this a year ago. And up until this February, it was going to be virtual. And I'm so glad to be here in the presence of friends, family, uh, and 
and lovers and supporters. And I'll talk a little bit about that. You know, in contexts like these, we don't spend enough time talking about love. And uh, that is something that I have been trying to bring forth along with many other folks as well. So I'm gonna do a little bit of that. So tonight, what I'm gonna do is to give you a little bit of my street cred, show you my artwork. I really am an artist. Uh, and to show you that, and then uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about where all that stuff comes from. And I'm gonna end on where it's gonna go. So I'm gonna try and go through this as quickly as I can, uh, but because this is a really small, intimate space. Uh, if I say something that you want clarification on, you can stop me. <laughs> say, say to what does that mean? Uh, I, folks who I'm closest to in my family will say, you're not being clear. What does that mean? And so please stop me. <laughs> Don't let me go on. Uh, but before I begin, just like the land acknowledgement that Jill just read, uh, I have to acknowledge the presence of the folks who came before, but, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but also to acknowledge the folks who are here, some of the folks who are here. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about family and family ties, and so, it's really important that I acknowledge the family that's here. Uh, my wife's oldest cousin, who is the, in, in terms of the um, seniority, in terms of the respect, in terms of the family traditions that she holds, you know, we have to acknowledge Wanda here, who lives in Sacramento with her daughter. You know, so I really... <laughs> I really appreciate you all's presence here. So thank you all for coming. And uh, I need to also uh, acknowledge my Goddard College posse. Uh, <laughs> Sharon, who I taught, who were, Sharon and I were hired at the same time. Same, we showed up like, I think about a week after we were hired. <laughs> to, to come and to uh, work and teach in this hippie school. Uh, <laughs> and there are a couple of uh, graduates from that MFA in interdisciplinary arts program who are here as well. I need to acknowledge Constance and Hannah Pearl. Hannah Pearl um, is an herbalist, and I had a little... Uh, I had a little health hiccup last summer. And without my knowing, my wife contacted <laughs> Hannah. And she became part of my medical team. You know, so I appreciate that. And that's and that also is this outpouring of love, you know. And then these flowers came unexpectedly from people's kitchen collective. Y'all don't know about them here in the Bay Area, in Oakland in particular, you should. That deals with issues around food, food sovereignty, food justice. So thank you, Cedar, for bringing that up. Uh, so, uh, you know, and we're also expecting, and I'm gonna say this before she walks in the door, my, one of my wife's oldest friends, and I should, I, this, I did this earlier today, I shouldn't use the term oldest, one of her longest <laughs> friends uh, who lives here in San Francisco, we're able to spend some time with. So that's a, a lot of those acknowledgements. Uh, and also a big shout out to Jill and her crew. Uh, Fred, who is here, worked with the graduate students here on campus uh, and uh, the folks who, Work, work with me yesterday to organize that workshop. Uh, that was, it was fantastic. I mean, the resources that were there, I didn't really have to do anything. Uh, so thank you all. <laughs> 
And so this is, you know, I, also a year ago, came up with the title of this talk and, and things change more. And so the basis of it is still there, but not quite. And, uh, you know, one other little acknowledgement I need to make to um, Wanda's grandson is here. <laughs> and I'm going to put him great grandson. great grandson. I forgot. Yeah. Who is uh, just starting his college career. And uh, one of the things that he may consider is he's, he's an artist. So we'll see what happens. So you have to follow Tristan here over time. Um, but the title of this thing is called Blues for George times two. So this is like a blue for two Georges. And I'll talk about that and you'll see what that is as we get, uh, as we get closer to this thing. So I'm gonna share with you like some of my food related stuff, kind of sort of food related stuff. I have done uh, around the country collard green shrines. Uh, these shrines that are these access points for us to begin to talk about African-American cuisine in particular and African-American culture in general. And these contributions that folks have made uh, that generations of folks have made to shaping our food ways. And I say our food ways collectively, you know, these contributions have changed our palate in the way that we eat. And so this piece was the first collard green I did, and this is over 20 years ago at Project Row Houses in Houston, Texas. And here, I ended up creating, uh, I found this sofa on a boulevard, painted, covered the walls in canvas to create this shrine, and then collected collard green recipes from visitors that, that came. I keep saying at some point, I'll have to try all those recipes and we'll do a book. Uh, this was a, another collard green shrine. This is in Lewiston, Maine at uh, Bates College. and um, and this was created from recycled cardboard. And so I found, I painted these things, created this, this collard green plant that at its widest was about, um, uh, uh, about 14, 15 feet. I can't remember the exact dimensions. This is another collard green shrine that was suspended in the atrium of um, in the atrium of the Urban Institute for Contemporary Art in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And just a few years ago, uh, this was a part of Art Prize. I'm not sure how many of y'all are familiar with Art Prize, this international festival. Uh, and this piece was the companion to a meal that I helped curate in Heartside Park in Grand Rapids. And it, believe it or not, it won the grand prize at our prize. <laughs> uh, a piece in the Nashville Farmer's Market. And this is just a part of it. It's hard to take a photograph of it. And uh, even the professional photographs that we've received really don't do it justice. But this is uh, a piece that is suspended in the atrium of the Nashville Farmer's Market. It's a steel, I mean, aluminum piece that is suspended. And so, you know, a la Oldenburg, this is a, a basket that is eight feet wide with these turnip green leaves that are falling out of it and was dedicated during the Nashville Turnip Green Festival there. Uh, piece uh, for Harriet Tubman. Uh, this is uh, uh, core tin steel or the weathering steel here. It's about nine feet high. And this 
sat outside of the Tubman Women's Alliance, a shelter for uh, women in Minneapolis. And I did a small maquette of this piece just to kind of study it years ago before I created this. And that piece now is in the, the office of the St. Paul mayor, uh, first African-American mayor in St. Paul. And so every time you see him in a press conference, this piece is in the background, uh, hanging behind him. And he's told me, he said, I'm gonna be known as the guy in Harriet Tubman's armpit. <laughs> uh, another piece using boat building technology, uh, steam bending wood around wooden forms as a companion piece on the other side of this lobby in the library that um, in the library where my mother took us, I say us, me and my sister to borrow books to, uh, for us to learn how to read. <laughs> and, you know, I, I called you out, Donna. I'm calling Donna out now, again, too. Now, and I, she had to drive through, you know, you know, across the Bay Bridge to get here. And I, I said that my wife's, I, and I'm not gonna make this mistake, longest friend, I started, <laughs> not the oldest friend, the longest friend is, is, is here as well. And just making these acknowledgements. But this piece here is in the Sumner Community Library. And I worked on this piece with high school students uh, and, and a poet. So I have been working with poets and in integrating text into my work in different ways. Uh, this was just dedicated a, a set of railings on a bridge uh, crossing 35W in, uh, in South Minneapolis. And this was a neighborhood that I grew up in. And so I can remember when the freeway came through, just like so many other communities across the country, literally destroying the heart of the community. And so this using... Uh, this technique of uh, cutting out these, uh, these pickets. So we created this image that folks are able to see, and it's a ghost image of the, the homes that were lost. And I still paint. This is, I've been working on this whole series of self-portraits. I have been doing these, these portraits uh, of me in these roles and these positions uh, that African-American men have found themselves in for the last 400 years here in America. And so like one is uh, enslavement, another is the uh, great migration, another is hands up. In another self-portrait, and I should say too, those pieces are about nine uh, feet high, so they're really large pieces on uh, unframed canvas. Uh, this piece is graphite. Uh, me, you know, with these feet there in the background uh, in the street. This definitely is a pandemic piece, and these pieces are tiny. These are African masks. So these are all these different uh, uh, masks from the uh, different nations in Africa. For Black History Month this year, uh, as an exercise, I did a drawing each day of the Black Power Salute in different ways. And so this was this grand exercise and these are all real tiny. I posted these things uh, on using my Instagram account to share them. And I have been attempting this Japanese printing method, uh, uh, a geotaku. And what it is, is a way that Japanese fishermen 
would record their catches for bragging rights, uh, as opposed to going to the taxidermist and stuffing the kids. And this is leading up to this project that I'm attempting to do. What did I do here now? Did I step on something? Okay. <laughs> that, that's my life story. But uh, well, let's see. There it is. Okay. I am not going to touch anything else. But this is like a preview of this project that I'm going to, that I'm attempting next year in cold, hard Minnesota on a frozen lake. So we're going to practice this summer. I'm working with the watershed district in St. Paul, Capital Region Watershed District, where they're going to be cleaning these invasive carp out of a lake. And as they come out, I'm going to be working with them to print these fish on these big ban on these long banners. And this is like leading up to a project that we want to do on a frozen lake uh, this next winter, where we're literally harvesting these rough fish or these invasive fish and uh, along uh, and fishing and catching these things through the ice. Okay. Uh, and, and this is one of the, and and I should say that these fish will end up at a composting facility uh, so that it end up becoming fertilizer. So the farm that we help start are, is going to get 150 fish. Now we working with the farm manager there, we tried to come up with a ratio that wouldn't smell that bad over a period of time. So 150 is what we came up with. And this is, um, for those of y'all don't know, haven't seen this before, this is called the four moments of the sun. This is an African cosmogram that is the basis of many, of, uh, many written and drawn uh, glyphs, signs, and symbols on pavements throughout, the, throughout Haiti, uh, throughout parts of West Africa as well. A uh, way of telling the ancestors of which way to go. And so the four moments of the sun, this cosmogram is this point of inspiration for me. And so you can see that the line above is the world of the living, the line below is the world of the dead. And the dawn in the east, sunset in the west, noon, and then midnight. The real point of inspiration uh, was this man here, Houston Conwell, who passed a while back. And Houston Conwell did these fantastic cosmograms. This is in the floor of the Schoenberg Center. And this actually uh, is the resting place of the ashes for Langston Hughes. And so these are sacred signs and symbols. And that's what we did yesterday. Yesterday here was a point for us to begin to investigate those sacred signs and symbols. So yesterday, what we did is we created these stencils. Actually, I'll, I'm going to wait because I'll have just some other images really share that. This is the plan. And I'm going to show you another set of plans too, but this is the plan for uh, a cosmogram that I created for a, a garden and memorial space to honor the uh, life of Philando Castile, who was murdered by the police uh, and uh, murdered by the police in 2016 uh, in uh, in St. Paul, or in this actually a suburb of St. Paul called Falcon Heights. And so working with 
Philando's family, working with uh, an African-American-led architectural firm, <laughs> went off again here. Oh. Oh, that's all it is? Damn, OK. Oh, OK. All right. So working with community members, you know, this piece. Nope, that's not working. Oh, there. Well, that might be. Is it or is it something? There we go. Oh. Okay, now let's try it again. You know what it what what it's saying is hurry up, say to and get through this. We can pull it up on a laptop too. Can you swap it out? Uh yeah. Let me try to Okay. Well, let, well I'm gonna try and keep going through this here. As well. I wanted to show you a detail of that and then another couple points. Ah, you know, it is the connection. There we go. Where is that going into? No, I think it's right here. Okay. At that, so I'm not going to try and deal with that. But this has his lifeline and his death line. And it's also lined up to uh, those, the axis there. Uh, indicates the uh, the date and sunset and sunrise for on those particular dates. So you're able to stand there in the shadow and have it cast on that center point, which will be a tree. You know, and here is a plan for Frogtown Farm where we work to sculpt or to create to sculpt the land and to create this living, breathing sculpture. So this farm is five acres, but you can see it doesn't have any traditional square plots in it at all. And from this farm, we have produced anywhere from uh, 2,000 pounds or a ton of food uh, in a season, or up to, we've done, uh, uh, 10,000 pounds of food from this little five acre organic farm using these permaculture values. And as Jill had said in, uh, in, my, in the introduction, I've done these food related events in different cities. And this was the first one in my own neighborhood to have this over the table conversation about food justice, about, uh, uh, about food sovereignty, uh, to introduce folks to the, the people who grow the food, who grew the food, working primarily with farmers of color and uh, working with an all African-American crew to prepare the food. And here you can see this table going down Victoria Street in the middle of Frogtown, the middle of our neighborhood, and how that line goes into the distance. Now, this is a part of what, once again, uh, sketching into the ground and working on creating these sculptures that you experience as you're walking across them. I've collaborated with two other artists, a friend of ours, uh, Dekumba Aiken, uh, who is uh, a, a sculptor, a painter as well, a uh, collaborator of mine and friend of mine for over 40 years, and uh, with Soini Guyton, my wife. Uh, so together, the three of us have created these sculptures that are in downtown Minneapolis. That's where this is from here. And each one of these shadows was created just like we did yesterday, where we lined ourselves up to the sun. And although these were done on these 
days of like these particular solar holidays uh, on the spring equinox, the fall equinox, the uh, summer solstice and winter solstice. So we literally traced shadows and then wanted to commemorate these folks whose names are not uh, the names that go on buildings that go the name streets, but uh, folks who came and helped develop a space in some way. And we created a set just a couple years ago for the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden where Soyini created these poems. These poems from folks who came before. And lining them up at these particular points in the year, you're able to stand in the shadows of the folks who came before. This piece was dedicated to uh, Dred Scott and particular his wife, Harriet Scott. Now, all you all know, about the Dred Scott decision, one of the most notorious decisions that the Supreme Court has ever made. And where Dred Scott sued for his freedom, carrying all the way up to the Supreme Court. And finally, the Supreme Court came with this decision that not only uh, was he, not only was he, <laughs> he was still enslaved, and there are two points, and I'm trying now to, to, to get them out. You guys can even help me out here, too. But the two points, one was that he was not honored by the Constitution and, the, and that, the, uh, constitu that he had no rights under the Constitution. And Soyini felt that he probably wouldn't have even sued for his freedom had his wife not pushed him to that, not wanting her daughters to be. It, well, yeah, I stand correct. That was not. That is a fact. And. And so she was so concerned about the freedom of her two daughters that she urged Dred Scott to, uh, to, to file this suit. And so this poem and that shadow is dedicated to uh, Harriet Scott. But here's a little aside of that, that Sweeney so snuck into that. You can see the first letter of each one of those stanzas in that poem, Form Daughters. Another shadow dedicated to another woman who had been enslaved uh, there in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And this was the shadow that created that piece. So we trace these shadows on the summer solstice uh, in about the same position that they would be in in the Minneapolis Sculpture Garden. And so this is kind of what we were doing yesterday, but I'm gonna get to show you. And so you can see where that shadow, that bronze shadow came from. But yesterday we worked with this invention created by an artist in Seattle called Rainworks. And this is this resist solution. And of course it rains up there all the time. And I should have checked our shadows down outside to see in this rainy weather if, if, this, resist, uh, if this resist was working out there. It was good, it was good. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> and so yesterday we traced our shadows uh, in the sunlight yesterday afternoon. And what we're doing, this is, let's see if I can get this again here. Oh, okay. Let 
No, I'm not. And of course, you know, it's hard for an artist to talk without uh, pictures. So I have to have images here. So that's even like a, a, another cue to hurry up. Uh, and here we worked with a poem of an artist who I had mentored in and had lost his life in a horrible automobile accident and was a poet and a visual artist. And so we took his words to create this shadow that only reveals itself uh, when it's wet. Using that resist material. And so where all does this all come from? This is my great grandfather, uh, Joseph Parker, who was born in enslavement. And that's right, my great grandfather. So that's just like four generations removed. My grandmother, who I love dearly, uh, who died in 1968 in the old Rondo community, uh, was his daughter, uh, born in 1900. Uh, but he was born sometime in the 18. 30s and came to Minnesota uh, after he had gained his freedom, uh, joined the Union Army, was part of the Civil War, and then ended up in Minnesota in the 1870s. And I'm working on a project now. Uh, I'm going to be doing a month-long residency in the city of Red Wing where he settled a small river town. And we're gonna be doing something to mark not just his presence, but the presence of other African-Americans who came to these, a whole set of river towns in Southeastern Minnesota. But I grew up in this family and this is my grandmother uh, in her backyard. Now, Joseph Parker was a farmer. He was a, a porter in a hotel and he earned enough money in that hotel to begin a farm in Rochester, Minnesota, where my grandmother was born. So she had farming was uh, in her blood. And so she converted her backyard on Fuller Avenue uh, to uh, a little farm. And you can see some of the, the plants behind her. This is a portrait of me <laughs> uh, that my father began to paint and didn't finish. Uh, but it's one of my most treasured objects because I grew up in this family of artists. I had an uncle that painted. I had my father who painted and my aunties that could sew almost anything without a pattern, and <laughs> like Donna. <laughs> and, and so I grew up in that environment. They always encouraged me, never discouraged me from making art. And I was so fortunate and blessed to grow up into that environment. Uh, this is me. Uh, 52 years ago, uh, and, and so I got caught up in this rich mix of politics and uh, culture uh, and all of these different philosophies, you know, going from the nation of Islam to uh, uh, kind of Marxist-Leninist thought. There were some days we'd come out of the house and dress with the black beret and black leather jackets. And then there were some days we'd come out uh, with uh, big afros and uh, bandanas like Jimi Hendrix. And so we were dipping our toe into this rich mix of culture. And all of those things that came back and forth in my head, help form my philosophic foundation. 
And that was, you know, and this, I just had this flash on Goddard, the hippie school, because that's what we always wanted to, to get students to begin to profess is their philosophic foundation. And so mine began in this time here. And one of the tenets of that time, one of the things that I learned uh, was that you should leave your community more beautiful than you found it. And that still guides my work. And my recent project, you know, I've done a couple things uh, that are on my website that you can download for free. And right now I am working on that. You'll be able to go to my website and download and put in your own personal information is your own reparations invoice. Uh, so like I have been doing this reservation, this uh, reparations invoice. I may even leave one here, uh, you know, before I go. But to really think about, I mean, with this, the land acknowledgement that you did, we always have to remember that stolen people were brought here to work on stolen land. And this is another family member. Actually, this is, anybody recognize this person here? Donna does. Who is this person here? George Washington Carver. Another, he is our collective ancestor. Now, one of my aunties who sold and was a teacher in the St. Paul public school system and actually moved out to California. Uh, my aunt Beverly used to call me little George Washington Carver. And I would just bristle at that. I, of course, I never told my Beverly that, you know, that, that, why are you calling me that? It makes me mad. Uh, I would just kind of bristle and steam about it. And even at six and seven years old, I knew who George Washington Carver was. He was such an icon. I mean, we have perceptions and misperceptions about him. But she knew of my love of nature, love being out in the backyard. And, and I would always think like, why would I want to be like that old bald-headed man? <laughs> and like, here I am. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so she knew that, but she also knew something else about George Washington Carver that a lot of folks don't know. Oh, you know, one of the things, now we're in a land-grant institution, he helped codify and formalize the extension service. So like every school, every land grant school in particular that has an extension program to help folks understand how to grow and plant in particular crops, we owe a debt of gratitude to George Washington Carver. And so this was one of the early wagons. Now I put that in here and I don't know if I put in, no, I didn't, but what folks don't know is that he was a painter and that he was a painter even before he began to study plants. Uh, that he went to school at a small college in Iowa, Simpson College, and there, uh, while painting plants, an art teacher told him, you should study botany, and the rest is history. But he never stopped painting, never stopped making art. And my Aunt Beverly knew that he was an artist. So here was a person that we would now call a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary artist. But, you know, and, and, and actually even, you know, even though like I taught in that, in a program <laughs> where we awarded folks MFAs in interdisciplinary arts, that's still a clumsy term to describe what our graduates do what folks in Jill's program do. The way that we combine mixed mediums, the way that we are, the way that we frame the world even. 
Now this painting, uh, here he is as an old man, but this painting was in the Chicago Exposition of 1893, where he won an award. He won a, a national award for this particular painting. And his paintings keep coming up because he gave, he gave away a lot of his artwork. But painting nature, uh, his, you know, one of my most treasured pos possessions is something that I got here years ago. Here in, I think it was even Berkeley, a bookstore uh, that Donna took us to. And it, I, I was able to get uh, one of his bulletins. He created a whole set of agricultural bulletins that he distributed to farmers. And uh, he illustrated those. So when you get a chance to look at those, you need to check them out. Oh, and this, and check this out. This is something that I was talking to Fred about. There's no sound on this. This African-American dentist who was an uh, amateur uh, filmmaker went down and started, went down to Tuskegee and captured these images of George Washington Carver, wanted to get like a full picture of George Washington Carver. You know, he was so focused on his work, people always described him sometimes as shabby or he didn't care about his appearance. But now check out what he does here. Now, a lot of folks don't know he was a textile artist on top of all of that stuff. Uh, he, born in slavery, he was considered uh, sickly. And so he, rather than work out in the fields, the person who enslaved him uh, guided him to his wife that taught him the womanly arts as it was described. But he learned dyes, he learned uh, how to sew, and, and a lot of these textiles still exist. But this is the thing I was talking to Fred about, because Fred uses these lace patterns in some of his work as well. But he created these, these really intricate doilies and uh, these patterns. And I'm gonna be doing uh, a project at, uh, at um, University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, working with the community group there. We're gonna be doing shadows again. We're gonna be doing text. And one of the things that we're going to do is actually print recipes on the sidewalk. But what we're going to do there is to border them in some of George Washington Carver's lace patterns. Oh, and some of his stains, the kind of original title for this talk was 73 stains. He created 73 stains, but also created a whole set of colors using what was around him, the soils in Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia, the plants there. But one of the things that, I mean, he created so many different, uh, he invented so many different processes, created so many different products uh, and these stains and colors will blow your mind. But the thing that one of the five things that he patented was the recipe for Egyptian blue. Egyptian blue, you see in like art supply stores uh, and folks kind of lost the recipe. It would appear from time to time, uh, but it was the ancient Egyptians that really came up with this recipe that has lasted time. Well, George Washington Carver patented this blue. 
And this is this blue that I keep trying to explore. I mean, both is this metaphor for blues. And then it is, it's just a beautiful blue. Other artists, uh, this is a work by Terry Adkins, where he actually created a lot of those stains. Working with the uh, Carver Archive, uh, dug and found these recipes. Unfortunately, Terry passed uh, a, a while back. Another multidisciplinary artist who was also a musician uh, would perform at his openings. But he created this whole series of small paintings using that blue. But he's not the only one, not the only African-American artist either, but this is work by Jason Moran. Jason Moran uh, is uh, a musician, multi-talented person going back from uh, these different mediums. And Jason Moran also consciously used that blue. And here is a billboard that I created that appeared over George Floyd Square in South Minneapolis using those blues again. And this piece here, if you go to my website, you can download the pattern for this stencil to create your own George Floyd portrait. And so this piece has been downloaded by folks all over the world, spray painted on walls, on sidewalks, uh, as a way for us to remember. And memory is important. And that's kind of where I want to end. I've got a few more slides here. So I'm working on this initiative here. I have over time, I have lost, like all of us, friends, colleagues, uh, collaborators, family, uh, to all sorts of things. And it really pains me to see artists go without leaving any instructions for their legacy, without consciously thinking about what to do with their stuff. <laughs> and uh, my wife and I had a dear friend who passed, uh, a great artist, a great playwright. And she never signed her will. And as a result, her estate and her papers are uh, probably lost. And that wasn't that long ago. And, and that was somebody we knew, but you can go out and think about this on a national scale. Think about uh, Aretha Franklin dying without a will, James Brown dying without a will, and Prince, you know? And so we began to think with intention just how to plan our estate. So we don't leave a mess behind. It's still going to be a mess, but at least we'll have a set of instructions on how to guide folks on what to do with our mess. And hopefully this will be a template for other artists. This is another area, just like love, that we don't talk a lot about. And that's about this next season. Uh, and what to do with that stuff. And so uh, I am now working on this initiative that we're calling the Black Gate. And this, again, is sacred work. When we started this a couple of years ago, I didn't really think about other folks across the country working on the same thing. But led by uh, a group of folks called the Blacktivists based in Chicago and a group of archivists at the Smithsonian and uh, at, in New York at the Schomburg that are working with folks before we pass on to help 
uh, prevent our legacies from being erased. That's the other part of it. I mean, our legacies are easily erased and it shouldn't be easy. And so I'm working right now to raise the money to build. My wife and I have owned a vacant lot uh, about three blocks away from us. And for years, all we've done is get it mowed and shovel the walk. And it had been just like thinking about what to do with it. And so finally came up with this concept that we're calling the Black Gate. And so we're going to build a new studio with two spaces above it and a space for our papers and library so that folks will have access to it. You know, I've had folks already from the Minnesota Historical Society, from Ramsey County Historical Society, Ramsey County is where St. Paul is, is located, asking about the work. But we know that that work is sometimes inaccessible. We'll end up in the basement in storage. And so we want to create some access, an easily accessible space to look at uh, this work that we've collected, to look at uh, uh, my papers. I mean, the other part of it is like, I saved everything. Uh, so receipts, and I never thought about that as anything that folks would be interested in, but it's telling a story. So we now have a contract with the Minnesota Historical Society Press to begin to tell that story. So there'll be a book on, on my work and my, not so much on my work, but the context and the times that I worked in. And so this piece here, and I should tell you the story about the Black Gate. You know, a lot of folks will think, well, you know, Black folks, Black Gate, and we have a garden that we've developed over the last 20 years uh, living in this place. We live in a small storefront and uh, live upstairs and have studio space downstairs. That was another reason why I started this thing. Wanted to get all of this junk out of my space so we could <laughs> work again in this space. Uh, but we've developed a whole set of gardens and during the pandemic, when we first started talking about this, a couple of years ago, I invited some folks over and we have a gate. Uh, and I told folks to go to the Black Gate. And uh, one of the folks who came by said, man, I thought that was, I didn't know it was a real gate. <laughs> I thought that was the thing. And so that's why the, the, the Black Gate is there, the, that term. It is the thing. And so this is a photo image of it right now. Uh, I've got a bill in the Minnesota legislature in the House and in the Senate uh, so trying to raise at least some of the funds from uh, the state for the Black Gate. This is gonna be something that we're working on over and over again. So that's, this is where I'm gonna end. And this is my infomercial, my infomercial here, <laughs> is to get this word out. And uh, as I talk about it, to gain you all support, not necessarily sending dollars in, but just to work with other artists and remind folks that we need to think about uh, what's going to happen to our stuff, uh, whatever that is. And we need to do that so that our histories are not erased. So memory is so important here as a part of the legacy. So thank you all. <laughs> Yeah, any comments, questions, ideas? Um, I, I really liked that concept uh, or the uh, 
what you were saying about memory, like not being erased, um, having a legacy. Um, do you think, I think for your own work, um, one day when, you know, we all pass or when you pass, um, are you going to have um, a work that is going to be continued, like an art piece that's going to like- You know what? And I forgot to, you, you raised one of the most important points about the Black Gate okay. that I forgot. You know, I am so fortunate that I have this legacy all over in stone and concrete and steel that will live- long past me, but we wanted to create another kind of legacy. So those two apartments will be occupied by artists for up to a year. We're creating a residency program. So some of the money that we're raising and that we're asking the state for will go to the actual construction, but some of it will go to uh, developing uh, developing a fund that will help support and create a uh, residency program. And so these folks would be based right in the heart of Frogtown, right where, up the street from where we live. And, uh, and we're going to be looking for folks that have a strong uh, community engagement component to their work to help foster that, to help uh, enrich that as much as we can. And so yeah, I'm glad you, you brought that up. So that will actually, so we want that to be even a longer lasting legacy uh, as opposed to the work that is, is physical, that's object-based. Yeah, no, I, I like that. It's also sort of like, an oral passed down thing as well as um, a continued like residency. Oh, absolutely. I really love that. Sorry. Absolutely. You know, and this, and we, we hope to do this as soon as we open the doors and looking to do that in 2024. So just a couple of years from now. So, and I hope to be around still. I mean, I, I'm talking about this and talking about this next step, but I, I, I'm hoping to be able to use that studio. I'm planning on using that studio space that will also have uh, a commercial kitchen that will, and so some of the artists will actually be chefs and they will over time. And so this commercial kitchen is going to be tiny and it'll be a food lab. You know, there are a lot of food incubators and there are a lot of commercial kitchens out there, but what we want to do is to create uh, a space where a chef can come research, experiment, uh, try new things out. The, and this kitchen will open up on the street. <laughs> Anything else? Um, I really liked your talk. Um, thank you so much. I. My, I guess my question is um, about how you've navigated the world, the art world, or like your career as an interdisciplinary artist, like how that has been for you. Um, I'm asking because I'm very interdisciplinary and often feel like a little bit out of like, I don't know. Yeah. How has that been? Is it, has it been? Yeah. I'm just kind of curious about your experience. Uh, it has been both fun, exhilarating, and frustrating all at the same time. I mean, yeah, you know the routine. I, when I first began this path, you know, over 50 years ago, when I first went away to school, you know, folks could not spell interdisciplinary, let alone think about what it is. And things were so siloed there. And I wanted to try everything. And uh, I had advisors and other instructors that said, Jones, you got to focus. What are you going to do? You want to, you can't do pottery and photography and printmaking. You can't do all that. You have to decide on one of these things and focus and follow that path. And so that was the biggest frustration. And, and so as a result, uh, I'm outing myself right now, but I don't have any degrees in art. Uh, I've got 
a bachelor of science degree in landscape design. And I've got uh, um, uh, my graduate degree is in environmental history. Those are tools that I use in my work. And I'm glad I went that path. And I'm glad I didn't get a BFA. I shouldn't say that in front of my MFA students in front of you all. But, <laughs> but now, you know, be able to draw from all these things. And I have all these different passions. And I haven't even talked about some of the things uh you know tomorrow i'm going to hang out with fred and we're going to talk boats you know i'm building a boat right now and uh, that i've got in my garage i'm doing this residency uh for a month and i'm going to drag the boat down there to finish fitting it out uh and i and and wherever my wife will tell you wherever we've gone in the African diaspora, I look and sometimes even arrange the trip so we can hang out with the boat builders, with the traditional boat builders. I even commissioned uh, a canoe uh, once. But I'm sitting here going off track, way off track. Kind of an answer to your question. You know, I have also used this as an asset. So uh, I have been uh, you know, there's some folks in some worlds that wouldn't even know or even understand what we were talking about here tonight. So I do a lot of work in theater. Uh, I do, I'm a scenic designer, uh, actually even a member of the union <laughs> and a member of a theater company, one of the oldest African-American theater companies in America, Penumbra Theater Company. Uh, and so I, so that's one area. And, and then I, most of my income is from being the artist on, a des, on design teams and helping integrate artwork into uh, commercial structures, residential structures, uh, infrastructure primarily, bridges, you've seen that. And so like I work with engineers, uh, work with architects there. And so uh, that's another area. And then I've been fortunate uh, to get uh, a few other commissions to keep me going. And so those are, uh, all those are paths that I wanted to try. And, and, and the, the reality is, you know, somebody dangles a couple dollars in front of me and I say, oh, sure, I can do it. And, and I do that less and less now and working with other artists, in particular, younger artists to, to, to really open up those kind of pathways and doorways. But it's being open to the world and even thinking about uh, ways that folks haven't even come up with in integrating art into our daily lives. And so you have to be open. Uh, and, and despite the frustration, despite living in this hyper-capitalist system, is to not to lose sight. Anything else? One more. Okay. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you. And thank you for the illuminating talk. My question may be too um, elusive <laughs> to answer. <laughs> See, but Fred you, has to ask the hard <laughs> question. But you know, you talked about legacy and we talked about history and you talk about reparations. And I know the city of Berkeley has said that they were going to provide reparations for African folks. What does that look like? Right. How does that, what lasting can they give a single human being? You know, How do they this pay is, us back? yeah, this is an argument that my wife and I have all the time. How we should receive reparations in what form? Uh, and there are uh, a million ideas out there. Uh, Tanishi Coates, in a, a great article that appeared in Atlantic several years ago, said reparations, I mean, wrote up uh, how folks were denied housing opportunities just in the south side of Chicago. And we see that repeated over and over and over again. And what 
he felt is that there should be housing opportunities, uh, that reparations should come in the form of housing opportunities. Uh, I've read that if every African American that was promised 40 acres and a mule uh, was given that 40 acres and a mule, that would be this wealth that would be multiplied from generation to generation to generation. And how some economists uh, calculated out what that would be, and that would be about $800,000 for each Black person. Uh, and for my invoice, you know, I, I'm going to be going for that $800,000. Uh, and I'm going to be distributing it widely to different folks, you know, just asking for a piece of it as we go on. Uh, but so, and, and some folks feel that that should be, that reparation should come in the form of educational opportunities, like tuition free any school you want to go to, you know, that should be paid for. Uh, so what you're asking is this whole, uh, and I think it could be and should be all of those things and more. <laughs> uh, but we need to begin to plot and plan it. Uh, you know, here in California, folks are beginning to talk about it in different parts of the US folks uh, are formally creating uh, panels that are kind of quasi governmental panels sometimes have folks in philanthropy on them, you know, on and on and on, you know, now the danger is that, you know, we could be talking about this for the next yeah, or more, <laughs> or more. And uh, we need to come up with, with something first, that toe in the door. And I don't know exactly what that, even in Congress, I mean, folks are talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, here in California, cities like Sacramento, folks are talking about it. What form should it be? You know, they could also give me that boat too, Fred. So <laughs> I might be happy with that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Or, or even a house in Berkeley. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Anything else? Uh, well, I just want like, I want to begin like, I want to end like I began and just acknowledging all the folks here, uh, acknowledging like uh, family, acknowledging friends, acknowledging new friends here. Uh, and I, I look forward to seeing you all again and, and, and working with you. Thank you. <laughs>